Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I've got a treat for you now. This is part of my Obscure Weapons series. And these are two weapons that are obscure only to modern audiences, certainly modern Western audiences. In their time, they actually would have been very well-known objects, but they are really, really not well-known today. Hence, I think they fit into the Obscure Weapon series. Now, both of these are replicas, and both of these are from LK Chen, the um, manufacturer of historical Chinese weapons. So there you go. So firstly, they're both Chinese weapons. And these are both things that uh, existed at the same time and were used together and that might literally blow your mind. Okay, so the first one is a sword. Now, uh, many people will be familiar through my channel uh, with Western swords like this sabre here or various types of basket hilt which have developed hand protection and we often talk about um, the kind of evolution of swords from a very kind of European point of view but if we go to China what we find is all the way back around um, around 1 AD essentially so in the Han Dynasty there were lots of things that existed which then didn't exist again until much much later in some cases in Europe and this is certainly one of these is an example the other one actually has a parallel in India which I'll talk about um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a sword and this is a type of jian. Now, a jian is a straight double-edged Chinese sword. You all know what a jian is. I've shown lots of types of jian on my channel, and they're fairly well-known swords. They're certainly not obscure. But this type is not well-known at all. Now, that's right. It has a massive handguard on it. Now, the Han Dynasty, when was that? So we're talking about approximately 200 BC to 200 AD. Um, so, so sort of the Roman era, if you want to think of it like that in Europe. And additionally, so 2000 years ago, and additionally, this was, I believe, the second uh, imperial period in China. So the Han Dynasty was incredibly uh, powerful, developed, very high technology for the period. But there were lots of things that came about during the Han Dynasty in China, which we don't really see again until later in other periods in other places in the world. And one of those things is Fencing schools, that's right. So in the Han Dynasty, fencing was a very popular activity. And to some degree, fencing weapons diverged from typical battlefield weapons. So, and this applies to both objects I'm going to show in this video. So indeed, uh, we see specialised swords developed um, around fencing. Now, when we're talking, what do we mean by fencing? Well, essentially, we mean swordsmanship schools, so there were professional swordsmanship teachers, different lineages, different schools, just like we see in later periods in Europe or in Japan or various other places, India. Um, so there were different lineages of fencing instruction and the swords, uh, for, and also dueling as well, so there was a dueling culture and those two things often go hand in hand because, as you'll know from any kung fu film or uh, kind of Akira Kurosawa, uh, you know, samurai movie, when you get people practicing lots of martial arts, a lot of those martial arts students then go out and fight each other. It's just kind of something that happens. And this happened in medieval and Renaissance Europe as well, very well documented, and was one of the reasons that fencing schools in certain places like England and France were, during the Middle Ages, regulated because they were often places where trouble started. So often, you know, a fight between two rival martial arts schools might break out into a riot and boom, the, you know, the, the powers that be, the, um, the monarchs and, and their officials were having to deal with the fallout of it. So simply, uh, when you get these rival martial arts schools, not only do you get a culture of dueling, which we see right the way through uh, you know, Europe's medieval and renaissance period, equally you see it in Japan, particularly in the, shall we say, the, not so much the 16th, but more the 17th um, and 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and that happened in China as well. So um, obviously it's not hugely well documented, so we don't know a colossal amount. We don't know, for example, as far as I know, we don't know anything about the Han Dynasty actual fencing teachers or the different systems or their schools. No treatises or manuals survive from that time, unfortunately, so it's all reconstructive um, kind of experimental archaeology, if you want to call it that. Now, let's look at the sword. So, this was a divergence from the um, mainstream Jian in a number of ways. So, first of all, as you can see, it has a rapier-like blade. In fact, if I just grab a rapier off the wall here, okay, so this is modelled on an uh, English rapier of the middle of the 17th century, you'll notice the blades are 
similar lengths, similar widths, similar distal taper, similar weights, they move quite similarly. There is a lot of parallel, certainly in the blade, between this 2000 year old Gien design and the 17th century European rapier. Just hang that back up. There we go. So, um, so first of all, the blade seems to be quite specialised towards civilian duelling, optimised for uh, using the thrust, uh, but also can deliver an effective thrust. And I tell you, this is a sharp blade, and I absolutely wouldn't, you know, some people say rapiers can't cut. Well, it depends on the type of rapier, depends whether it's sharp or not, and what the cross section of the blade is, and the width of the blade, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the fact is that you absolutely, you can probably hear the swoosh from that, would not want to get one of those you know, wearing normal clothes, wearing your typical dress and without anything protecting your head and that kind of hands and that kind of stuff. You absolutely wouldn't want to take a cut from this very fast moving, very sharp blade. Very similar to lots of rapiers, similar to certain types of spadroon as well later on. Now, the unusual part about this is really the hilt, okay? So we do find blades like these on some battlefield or warlike Jian, uh, but then we normally only have a small guard on those swords for a number of reasons probably, probably largely because you're going to be wearing the sword most of the time and your main weapon is going to be a bow or a spear or perhaps a halberd, glaive type thing, um, but primarily this is a sidearm so you want to be able to wear it. Now you'll notice this is quite inconvenient to wear and in that sense it has uh, some parallels with things like basket hilts which are fantastic hand protection but they're not very nice to wear um, and so things like sabre hilts which are uh, open at the sides are a good kind of compromise because you've got a good amount of hand protection and open sides. But one thing I should say is we don't have an awful lot of these surviving. They appear in Han Dynasty art and we do have some archaeological surviving examples. This is based, as far as I understand, on one particular one that was found archaeologically which has a large plate. This is pretty much the most protective type. We'll talk about the actual plate in a minute. Um, there are other types of these which just have a knuckle bow. Okay, but nevertheless, a knuckle bow um, is, we'll just grab a sword with a knuckle bow. So here's an 18th century hunting hanger with a knuckle bow. A knuckle bow is something we think of coming about in Europe in the 15th century and then gradually loads of swords have knuckle bows in the 16th century and from then onwards. And again, a knuckle bow is a good compromise between having a, you know, something at the front of the guard to pro provide more hand protection, but it still being quite easy to wear and not adding much weight and not getting in the way. This is more akin in some ways to a sabre guard in that it has a large plate on the front. But you will notice because of what was normal for the design of swords and technology at the time, we still have a cross guard in here. So we've got a cross guard and then the plate is attached at the front and actually links down to the grip. On the archaeological examples, this bar seems to go under here on the front of the tang. Um, so this is sort of different in that we've got a plate added onto the front of a cross guard. Now what's funny actually is that um, on certain other types of hill, if I just grab the hunting hammer again, Again. Often on European swords, the added protection is on the side, originally side rings or the nagel on a langmesser, which becomes a shell guard, and on a, something like a dusak, for example, um, becomes a, a plate on the side. Now that actually tells us something about the swordsmanship style practiced. The fact that the uh, Chinese Han Dynasty one of this has a plate on the front rather than a plate on the side possibly tells us certain things about how these swords were being used in their fencing systems and which parts of the hand were vulnerable. That being said, having this large plate on the front does still provide quite a lot of protection to the side, but we should also mention that they were perhaps more commonly didn't have this plate, they perhaps more commonly just had a knuckle bow. Okay, but nevertheless it's added hand protection and this is a specialised thing we see in the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago, specifically associated with civilians, duelling, fencing schools, any parallels with the rapier there that you can think of? So it's almost like um, really 1500 years earlier, um, so one and a half thousand years earlier in China, a lot of the same design choices and decisions were being made in China with these swords as had been as were going to be made in Renaissance Europe later. Now I mentioned there were two objects, here's the other option, and this is also, it goes with this, uh, often paired with it in the Han Dynasty, we think, according to some of the artwork it suggests that, 
Um, and it is a specialised object used by civilians. As far as we know, there are some limited... There is some limited evidence they were perhaps carried by lightly equipped troops in war as well. But we think, the current thinking, is they were primarily a civilian dueling implement to be used with a sword, either with this or a, uh, a Dao or a, um, a simple Jian without the added hand protection. And it's a buckler, but it's not just any buckler. It's a, I think it's called a Gorang, if I'm pronouncing that right. Please correct me if not. And it's a very specialised buckler. Now, I'm going to put the sword down. I'll talk about the two together in a minute. Um, but it's a very specialised buckler. The first thing you'll probably notice about it is these two iron horns or bars, um, almost like uh, sort of buffalo horns on the end. Now this has some parallel with various other shields that you can find around the world. At the end of the day, it might actually originate from what are known as parrying sticks. Uh, they use the Aborigines, Aborigines in Australia use them, for example. Um, where essentially you just have a long stick of wood and you put a hole through the middle of it, a bit like a dusak handle, and then you hold it in the middle and that enables you to, certainly against spears, even thrown things or even shot things like arrows, to, to knock them off from the side in various different ways. But if you add a buckler in the middle, you now gain the ability to more effectively um, directly go into cuts that are coming in and engage those cuts like you would do with a shield. So what you've now got is the benefits of a, of a parrying stick with a shield in the middle, a buckler. Um, so you can use it as a buckler, you can use it for trapping and controlling an opponent's weapon, whether it be a sword, a spear or whatever. And additionally, in the case of this, uh, and some of the surviving ones, we have a projecting point here as well, which of course you know that you find on certain types of uh, buckler. You find a point usually in the middle more, um, or indeed on a Highland Taj. And obviously because of the way that the bar grip is constructed, that is presumably a convenient place to put the spike rather than having it in the middle, because you can perhaps make it of one simpler construction having it up there. So you've got several different options, and as mentioned, these were used with swords, and they're shown in artwork being used with swords, and we believe that 2,000 years ago in China, these were popular dueling instruments. So in much the same as in medieval Europe, we find sword and buckler, and then later on sword and dagger, rapier and dagger. It seems like this was the most popular pairing, either using the sword by itself, which was probably actually more common, or if you wanted to carry a buckler around like this, and this was possibly used by lightly equipped troops, perhaps civilians who were in military service, uh, militias and things like that. Because remember, we've got battlefield weapons, we've got civilian weapons, they can be specialised, but often civilians have to go to war and so they take their civilian weapons with them. And we see the same thing in Europe with uh, what we typically class as more civilian type swords, things like the Cinque Dea or certain types of rapier. And the small sword, which was undoubtedly specialised really for duelling, but the small sword was nevertheless taken to war. So we do see weapons which we might describe as more civilian taken to war anyway. Okay, it happens. Um, so these two weapons, incredibly unknown to most people these days, but 2,000 years ago in China, incredibly well known. And in fact, probably if there was more documentary evidence, if there were more archaeological examples, if it wasn't so damned long ago, <laughs> um, you know, if this was 500 years ago we're talking about, or if they were still using these in the 19th century, we'd probably all know about these. Uh, but I think it's just amazing that we see parallels. And I did mention India, incidentally, about these shields. So you'll notice there is a strong parallel between this and the Indian Madhu um, shield. The Madhu usually actually uses horns from a type of antelope, I believe, uh, with spikes on the end and has a buckler in the center. But in effect, it's a very, the Madhu is a very, very similar object. And it even makes me wonder, given the uh, relationships, particularly if we go back into antiquity, between India and China, it does make me, in both directions, incidentally, a lot, it's believed that a lot of the martial arts stuff that we see in China originated in India. It does make me wonder if these shields used in China were perhaps influenced by early forms of Madhu in India, or if the Madhu in India was influenced by these Chinese shields. It could go in either direction. It could be that there was a convergent evolution and they're not connected at all. But in the end, they are quite similar objects and I believe used in quite similar ways. The only real notable difference is the Chinese version is very clearly hooked at the end, whereas the Indian version is more like a stabbing point. 
So, um, there we go, fascinating objects, and I think you should know about them and appreciate them. These examples happen to be from LK Chen, but they are based on archaeological examples and examples in art from 2,000 years ago. Amazing things, and who would have thought that something like a rapier blade and something functionally a bit like a sabre hilt existed already 2,000 years ago. Uh, and these shields are just super cool. And yes, in due course, I am going to be using, I've actually got a pair of these shields, we are going to be using them in sparring in my club now that we're training again. We've been reopened for about three weeks. So yes, absolutely, we're going to have a go at playing with these uh, with our swords and see what possibilities open up for them. I think they're fantastic and I think they have lots of advantages over a simple buckler. The big disadvantage and the obvious reason why I think they wouldn't catch on uh, most places in most times is they, how on earth do you wear it? One of the great things about a buckler, it's not as good as a shield, but a buckler you can wear and carry anywhere. I don't really know how to wear or carry this. It doesn't seem very convenient at all. Uh, but this seems a huge uh, improvement functionally on a normal Gien hilt. Um, and I do wonder if the systems that they were practicing must have changed and adapted for the fact that they've got these massive hilts now. I suspect they probably use these more similar to what we see in some of the back sword and single stick systems in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and a lot of the ways that we see the gen, the gen typically being used, surely if you're just dueling and fighting for sport or fighting for, for honour, blood, whatever, if you've got this hand protection, it's going to change how you fence to a certain degree. We do arguably see that in Europe when uh, more complex hand guards start coming along. Anyway, fascinating weapons. I hope that they have been interesting for you and open up new areas of reading and research and, and just your general knowledge about what was around in China 2000 years ago. And uh, any of your thoughts, any of your further knowledge, clarifications, improvements on my pronunciation are welcome right below here in the comments. I hope you're uh, subscribed. Please give me a like and I'll see you really soon back on the channel for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.